Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that intro, Chris. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, we're really stoked to talk about uh, this short film that we've been making in Houdini called Turbulence. Um, I'm Christopher Rutledge. I'm Magnus. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. But first, we're just going to, just if you don't know who we are, you're not familiar with our work, we're going to give you uh, a little taste of kind of the stuff that we're doing both myself and Magnus's amazing studio, Tumblehead, which is an incredible team that we've been working with on this project. Um, so I'll just play this quick little reel of our combined works. Thank you. So yeah, hopefully that gives a little bit of a sense of the kind of weird, uh, super stylized, cartoony, floppy, upsetting character animation that we like to do. Um, and uh, now we'll move on. And uh, before we kind of get into uh, the presentation and talking about the short, we want to show you a, a quick preview. Uh, it's very work in progress. We've been working on it up to the last minute. and. You know, it's some stuff that's starting to be rendered. It's not final yet, um, but it will hopefully give you a sense of, you know, what this will turn into over the coming months as we finish this. Anything else you want to say before I play it? Oh, that's all. Perfect, Chris. Okay, great. Just wanted to flag that uh, we may be experiencing some turbulence shortly. Uh, we'll do our best to keep it down to a minimum, but we would appreciate uh, everyone keeping their seatbelts fastened at this time. And uh, we thank you in advance for your cooperation. <sighs> oh, so sorry. Uh, is this normal? Oh yeah, this is totally normal. Uh, are you sure? H how do you know that? Yeah, so basically my uncle, who's like this super experienced pilot, told me that the chances of a turbulence related accident, it's actually crazy rare. It's all about like aerodynamics and thermodynamics and and, 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 and even with turbulence like this, like it's probably really, really unlikely that the plane would crash. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, that's the first minute or so from the film. It's a nice close up on our character Mike. Um, but I wanna I wanna go back and talk a little bit about kind of how uh this project came to be from the beginning. Um so uh uh Magnus did a a presentation about sort of working on this film at FMX about a month and a half ago, um, and talked about sort of the rigging and uh all the sort of character animation stuff that we started to do in Houdini. Magnus has mainly been uh, doing rigging using the new Apex system in Houdini, um, building all the character rigs for our amazing animators. Um, so you can check that talk out online if you want sort of a deeper dive into some of that stuff. Um, but I want to go back a little bit further and talk about kind of how this film started to begin with uh, from sort of my perspective. Um, so I've been uh, working with side effects for a while now. This was one of the first things I did with them was this tutorial series called Creating a Mega Character in Houdini that sort of emphasized and showed off how to do the entire sort of pipeline in Houdini if you wanted to make like a character-based short. Um, so, uh, which starts with modeling the character in Houdini, rigging with kin effects, uh, 
uh, animation, um, building uh, the sort of vellum simulation, creating the mega character, and then rendering everything with Karma. So everything all done entirely in Houdini, which is how I love to do my stuff when I can. Um, and Side Effects had me come and do a talk at Annecy a couple of years ago. Um, and there I met in person for the first time my hero, Magnus, who I've been talking to uh, since we met originally on the, the Redshift forums in 2017, back when I was still a student trying to figure out how to make my graduation film. Uh, and uh, I was obsessed with all these really cartoony, super stylized characters and rigs that Magnus is making that are like these flat characters, but they're designed in 3D, but they're really meant to only kind of work from one side and these really fun kind of cartoony rigs to work with them. Um, and uh, around that time, he made this awesome film uh, with Tumblehead um, called uh, The Story of Martin Luther. Is that the yeah, right yeah, title? Pretty yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very long name. So yes, okay, good. yeah. Anyway, you, uh, you can get a kind of sense of the kind of work that they were doing at the time from that, and that sort of inspired some of the work that I was doing with my, my senior project called The Loaf Zone, which is a very silly film with lots of characters and stuff. And around this time, we were both starting to get into Houdini. Um, and so we met at Annecy, uh, and uh, you know we're doing a lot of flying to go to festivals and things like that. And we were talking about how we both just loved how to kind of like tinker with different pieces of technology and learn all kinds of new kind of techniques that we could create using things, whether they're VR or Houdini or you know any kind of other new tools coming out. Um, and Magnus's studio was making some films. Um, and they made this film uh, on the left um, called Tales from the Multiverse that is amazing, uh, that shows kind of how God created the Earth in his 3D program and sort Extremely of... Extremely accurate, by the way. Yes, yeah. it proves why the Earth is actually flat. Um, and uh, th that was the first time they used Houdini on a project to do uh, the lighting and, and, and look dev and stuff, I believe, right? Yeah. Um, and then later, we're working on this other film that should be out soon called Freelance, which they did a talk about, Magnus did a talk about last year uh, at Annecy, and you can check that out online as well. Um, so anyway, I was like obsessed with Tumblehead and obsessed with Houdini, and we were both nerding out about all the new cool animation tools, the rigging stuff with KinFX, and you know, I was thinking about making films, and I had this idea for a film that I really wanted to make about uh, air travel and turbulence, um, and so why make a film about turbulence? Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. One is I, I feel like when you're on a plane and you hit turbulence, internally it's terrifying and you feel like you're going to die, but you sort of know externally that everything's going to be okay. And so it, internally you feel like this guy on the left and then you look around and everybody's looking like these guys on the right who are just completely unfazed by you know the turbulence that you're experiencing. Um, I also just love on airplanes like the feeling of being sort of stuck in this crazy scenario with all these strangers with all their own unique stories. I always really liked sort of the setup for the show Lost because of that, but I thought that that would be a fun thing to build a film out of. Um, and also like, I don't know if people have noticed, but like turbulence has getting, been getting crazier every year as like global warming is affecting sort of the, the air currents and things. And I don't know exactly how it works, but turbulence has been getting worse. Um, and so, I was talking to Magnus about you know this idea for this film, and I want to make something with him. And we're talking about you know Houdini, and well, what if we made this film with Houdini together? You know, maybe we could use KinFX for the animation. Um, now, why make this film in Houdini? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. One, of course, we we love Houdini. We're having a ton of fun learning this software. Um, we also love side effects. I mean, it feels like one of the few companies that really genuinely cares about their customers and isn't just trying to like appeal to their shareholders or whatever. Um, like I really absolutely love that. Um, it's, it's very, very rare that you find that kind of thing. Uh, and there's tons of untapped potential for character animation stuff in Houdini. I think, you know, again, most people think it's just a program for effects still, and it's super not the case. And you can do really crazy stuff as you've been seeing from our work. Um, but there's a lot of potential for more people to explore that kind of stuff as well, I think. Um, and we were just kind of getting sick of using other softwares as well. Um, and there's also lots of crazy potential for effects and simulations in this film that we wanted to make. So we sort of pitched this idea to side effects, and this is sort of what the pitch looked like. 
uh, talking about what happens when you think you're going to die when you're on an airplane. Um, you know, you're looking around, you're seeing everybody else is calm, but you're again internally kind of freaking out. Um, and we wanted to make it kind of combining our, our visual styles. Tumblehead's got this really amazing, super stylized rigging and animation and, and stuff. And all their stuff just looks beautiful in every way. And then my stuff's maybe a little bit like grosser or more like leaning on, I don't know, f floppy simulations and disgusting textures and stuff. So we wanted to find kind of a, a mixture between those two to explore. Um, and then uh, also, of course, wanted to see if we could bring some of Magnus's insane rigging uh, setups from Maya into Houdini. Um, and so we were talking about we'll, we'll do the whole film in Houdini pretty much with the exception of like a few things like maybe, you know, sculpting or whatever. Um, but almost everything is being done in Houdini, uh, especially the, the rigging and animation and uh, using Karma and Solaris the built-in render engine in Houdini for all the lighting and rendering and materials and everything. Um, so side effects said, cool, let's, let's make this film. Uh, and then threw us into the beta for uh, Houdini. And we started learning about this new rigging sort of system in Houdini called Apex. And it was all kind of vague, but cool sounding and exciting, but also kind of scary. And uh, Esther, who's one of their amazing devs, sort of gave us a demo of it actually right before we did our talk last year here um, and you know the sort of going into it we were sort of like well what's apex does this replace kin effects we just got kin effects that's the new rigging system isn't it like this seems cool but it also seems really complicated and scary there's so much stuff to learn this is super overwhelming but uh, and seems harder than kin effects and also maybe most importantly like you're expecting Maya animators to work with this, like, and come all the way over to Houdini. That seems, you know, like a lot. Um, and then Houdini 20 came out, and, you know, of course, they got some, like, comments that were saying things like that. These are some of the worst comments I could find. <laughs> People said a lot of nice things, too. Um, but uh, after we've kind of spent some time with it and, and worked with side effects, my kind of take on, on Apex and everything is that Apex is... Basically, don't think of it as a, a rigging context or anything like that. It's really a new, super performant way to build stuff, just like there's so many other ways to build stuff in Houdini. You know, you can make stuff with just the nodes, with HDAs, with VEX, VOPS, C++, OpenCL, all depending on how technical you are. And now there's also Apex. Apex is not just for rigging, and it's being used for more things, and you'll see with every release, more and more stuff that Apex is going to start to power. Um, and so it's not replacing kin effects at all, actually. It's, they, they really work hand in hand. And you build stuff, you build rigs in Houdini with Apex nodes, or with kin effects nodes within Apex, as well as within SOPs. Um, and uh, you know, in order to build something like what side effects is trying to do with Apex, they need to start with these lower level tools and the sort of higher level tools and the UX and everything like that that makes it easier for people who are much less technical to get into it is stuff that all kind of comes later. So it just takes a long time and it takes a lot of feedback that side effects gets from people using it and things. So rest assured, if you're not using Apex yet, my what I'm saying is don't stress about it. It will kind of come to you over time. Um, and uh, yeah, just like you know, any new thing that side effects starts building, they keep putting a lot of love into it and it gets better and better, just like Solaris and KinFX and Vellum and all these other great things. Um, and we've been working super closely with them to try to push our feedback and, and, and help improve it. Um, so then that leaves the question, well, how are animators liking using Houdini? And I'll pass it off to Magnus to talk about this. Yeah, so we were very lucky to uh, have Jess Benke and Meditanya on the team. And woo! And Meta is actually here, so give a big hand to her. Woo! <laughs> Just sitting over there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Meta is super talented animator, Jesper as well. And they both have a background with 2D and also animating a lot in Maya, obviously. So it's very interesting to get them over to Houdini and try the new tools. So yeah, I asked Meta for some quotes about her experience rigging it, no, animating in Houdini. And <laughs> one of them, uh, does that mean I don't have to animate settles anymore? Amazing. <laughs> because we added some procedural stuff where it would add like overlap and jiggle stuff automatically. 
which I will show later. It's really fun. And uh, we got really frustrated with the hotkeys, but then we found out it was T for translate, R for rotate, uh, etc. It made kind of sense. So I was really happy about that. <laughs> Another cool thing that we got feedback on is that uh, like mirror, tween, blend, ease, offsets, animation, noise, library, all of that uh, is just a part of Houdini. Uh, so the post library and picker will come to Apex as well. But it's nice to have this whole environment where you don't rely on plugins and extra licenses and all that stuff that goes wrong in the pipeline. And overall, it's just been amazing how quickly these guys have adapted to using Houdini for animation. I mean, they really were able to basically like pick it up and run with it pretty quickly, despite the fact that we're also working with the beta. And so, you know, things will break from build to build sometimes. Um, it's been amazing. So, yeah, we'll show a quick work in progress shot from Meta that's been utilizing a lot of the sort of overlap and stuff. And it's, it's still a pretty bare bones shot in terms of the animation and the key poses and stuff. But then there's lots of this sort of procedural overlap that's driving a lot of the animation as well. So. Is this your first time on an airplane? No, I've been on airplanes plenty of times. I love airplanes. I think it's a real feat of engineering that we made this, you know, giant hunk of metal stain the sky. And they usually got two bathrooms. Yeah, it's amazing. My uncle's actually a pilot, and he told me it's because of the uh, aerodynamics that they're able to stay in the air. <laughs> yeah, I'm flying all the time for work. Turbulence is just like waves on the ocean, except in the sky. Right, right, exactly, exactly, because of the aerodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's obviously a work in progress, but it's been fun trying to just animate in linear and stepped and then have get all this overlap in real time in the viewport. Yep. Yeah, it's been really cool. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll pivot back a little bit to talk about one of the, the things that I've been building for this film and, and working on, which is this sweat generator HDA for making shots where, you know, this super nervous character who feels like he's going to die uh, is sweating and getting nervous. Um, and uh, I built it here. Um, it's got all these different kind of settings and stuff that I can tweak to choose like how fast the sweat moves and animate sort of the scale of the sweat and stuff. Um, and here's a really nice slow version of the shot that Jesper animated. I love the way that it looks in the beginning uh, with that crazy face. Um, but uh, basically the way that it works, just to break it down a little bit, is you bring in the character, you select the part that you want the sweat to have uh, on it, and um, then it sort of separates that out. It, you subdivide it to match the render time subdivision so that the sweat drops line up and stuff, just a subdivide node. Um, you time shift to your first frame, and we got this amazing first frame for this one, again, from Jesper. Um, and uh, then um, you scatter some points on that, uh, the head on that first frame, um, and uh, you add a bunch of like attributes like speed and, and things like that that are gonna affect like how quickly like certain random sweat droplets will kind of drip down the side of the face and stuff um, and the scale of the droplets and stuff. And then you move them down in a solver um, and then you do a simple min pos to just get them to stick to the face. Uh, and then that's basically it, right? Well actually no because then the, the mesh is actually deforming so then like the points are just going to stick to whatever the closest point is, which is changing every frame, and it gets all messy. So I was like, crap, how do I figure this out? And I was like, maybe I can do like a point deform in the solver. Um, but then I was like, how would that even work? That sounds insane. Um, and I just put a point deform in the solver, and then I realized, OK, if in, I'm using it in the solver, the rest frame just needs to be the previous frame. So I just did a time shift node there to use that as the rest frame. And then it's able to correctly point deform it every frame in the solver. And I was like, there's no way this is going to work. And then, oh my god, it, it actually works. And I get the sweat dripping down his face nicely with the character animated, kind of however the character's animated. Um, and then so what about you know the droplets that are going to be falling off, either based on velocity as he's moving really fast, or um, based on if they kind of get to the bottom of an area of his face and drip off. Um, and so I made a sort of setup to kind of create a group that 
sort of flicks off and then gets split out for one frame and then deleted within the solver using this blast node in the solver. Um, and uh, then that feeds into a pop net over here and some bits fly off based on either if they have enough velocity or if they reach the point uh, on sort of the bottom of the face using a dot product. Um, and uh, that ended up working pretty nicely. And you can see I'm kind of jumping from here into the split node and you can see where uh, over here they get split off and you can see just on certain points they're appearing just for one frame and then they feed into a pop net and then those particles come flying off and you get a nice sort of overlapping secondary motion uh, on top of the character animation that works really nicely and it's a nice procedural setup that I can then sort of throw on any shot. Um, then I just do some super simple VDB magic to turn them into proper sort of sweat droplets. Um, and then this is sort of what it ends up looking like. Um, but then I was wondering like, well, this is cool, but it's missing kind of an important part, which is leaving the trails of sweat behind. But doing wet maps is such a huge pain, and I, 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 like, I don't know even how we would approach that, except I guess there's this new thing in Houdini 20.5 that they're calling Copernicus, which is very mysterious. So what's Copernicus? Well, it's, it's new compositing operators, it's new compositing nodes. And uh, our friend at SideFX, uh, an amazing uh, intern over there, um, Waffle Boy Tom, uh, AKA Tom Gaffelli, uh, who we love, uh, helped uh, show us this awesome little setup using the new cops that are releasing for the first time in Houdini 20.5 soon. Um, and so it created this sort of texture on the UVs, on the character, all properly, all within Udini, without having to bake out any textures or anything. But the problem is that this isn't leaving the trails behind. It's just picking where sort of the points are on the face and just creating a map every frame. So I needed to feed it into a solver or do something like that to get it to like leave the trails behind. And you know, you can't quite do that yet in COPS. It doesn't have those kind of like touch designer type feedback things yet at least. Um, but uh, then I realized, well, actually, uh, you know, these images in COPS are, uh, what are images? They're actually just 2D volumes, which is the way that they're um, being read into Houdini is, or, or, or being considered in Houdini is they're, they're just volumes just with one voxel of depth. Um, so maybe I can just put them into a, a regular solver and then lo and behold, you can just use some basic volume operations, volume blur, and I used a volume mix to make it so that they sort of dried up a little tiny bit every frame, multiplying by like 0.99 or whatever. Um, and uh, I got these really beautiful sort of uh, sweat maps. Um, and uh, so then I can bring it back to COPS, and then I can export the maps now, right, to use as an image sequence in my render on my character's shader. Um, well, you can do that, but you actually don't have to. You can just use this sort of op colon slash context to point to the node that I am using in COPS, and then it just reads it in live. And so this is what it looked like before, and then this is what it looks like with the nice sweat maps now. And it's like a million times better, and it like updates live in the viewport. This is the new Vulcan viewport uh, in Houdini 20.5, and you can see I'm moving around and like it's updating these textures live with COPS with all these different kind of simulations and stuff going on, and it's not cached out as a USD yet or anything. It's just all reading live in Solaris as I scrub the timeline, which is amazing. Um, and so we're still messing with this and getting kind of the look that we want. Um, I was able to create this really nice kind of like coffee stain look, so maybe it's good for creating that kind of stuff as well. Um, but yeah, there's just a ton of potential with COPS and with doing stuff like wet maps and Houdini. It makes it so much easier now. Um, and here's another shot with you know the character sweating like that, an older render. Um, and there's also in this shot, uh, I'm demoing one other thing, which is the new wrinkle solver in Houdini that you can see as the character is hitting the back of the seat to kind of make things a little bit more uh, intense. Um, and then here's a... A, a render with that, um, the coffee stain looking uh, sweat drips. Um, so yeah, and I'll pass it back over to Magnus to talk about some look dev stuff. Yeah, thanks Chris. So I was doing the material setup for uh, the characters. 
And yeah, so what you see here is sort of a studio lighting look dev uh, HDA we made to, to quickly get a pass on all the characters. And I think when making look dev, it's especially important to check how the materials and shaders look in poses. And so we, we added that with the uh, USD, so you could just add, bring in like animation from whatever scene, layer it in on top. So it makes it really quick to, yeah, to test different shots right in the early stages of look dev. So it always looks different, I think, when it's in a pose. And here is just having some different uh, light setup as well, using the light mixer and a switch node, basically. Adding that to a slider, so you can choose different lighting setups to test the shaders as well. Um, yeah, so it's been super helpful to to have a very simple setup like that to go through all the characters. And then, let me see. So Søren Norbeck, which is our pipeline guy at the studio, he set up this shot builder node where so when you save the look dev in that other stream you just save it and then you can pull in the shot just from one node so it builds the whole usd scene so that way you can really quickly also just check your your look dev your shaders and materials directly in the scenes you don't need to open the scene it's all just stored in usd and you, anyone can pull pull it in really quickly yeah and then we had to do some look dev for the seeds. And we were going for this really mm, not so luxurious version of a plane, airplane seat. <laughs> and we found these patterns. And so we thought, OK, how can we recreate the pattern? So what you do is you find like your favorite logo online. <laughs> and you <laughs> go into Copernicus. Uh, put it in the tile pattern, which is new in 20.5, really, really cool node. This is just scratching the surface, literally, it can do so many things with it. But then you just play around with that a little bit until you're satisfied. And uh, here, Cecilia Rabeck, which is uh, doing look dev on the show, she set this up. Really, she's very talented on the tile pattern node specialist by now. So then you got that, and voila! <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest airplane seat I've ever seen. At least. <laughs> so then, what you can do when you do patterns in uh, in cups. You can simply grab that out node, just like Chris showed with the uh, wet maps, basically. So that's really nice. You just copy paste that and uh, put it into your shader. You just use the up colon uh, before the path. And then you can just in the shader mix mix more stuff in. So just mixing the colors in, mixing in some other textures. And voila. Some turbulence shortly. Uh, we'll do our best to keep it down to a minimum, but we would appreciate uh, everyone. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you saw that the first time around, but yeah, it's a very nice logo there on the seat. So here, uh, Danny Lawson, which is also doing look dev on the show. He's an amazing Houdini artist. Uh, he played around with using Copernicus and Light Gobos to drive the lighting. Uh, so here first he created like a nice little gradient, um, and then mixing in some noise pattern to kind of emulate clouds going by while they're inside the airplane. And so you can kind of set your lighting up in a texture-based way, which I think is really nice with the new release. Uh, and again, you feed that into your gobo node and it's not cached or anything you just put it in directly so then you can uh, change some parameters and uh, and see it update live in the scene 
which is which is quite nice. You can see here as he scrubs the timeline and then changes uh, some noise patterns, it will update live. And yeah, it's fairly quick to get to get feedback. This is super cool. So th this is how then it looks in the shot. So the, all the lighting here is done with, with textures. Uh, oh yeah, this is totally normal. Uh, are you sure? H how do you know that? Yeah, so basically my uncle, who's like this super experienced pilot, told me that the chances of a turbulence related accident, it's actually crazy rare. It's all about like aerodynamics and thermodynamics and, 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 and even with turbulence. Yeah, that, I think that was a great concept there than the R&D part than he did. Uh, and then we also did some CFX. I really like that you can kind of fix intersections and stuff uh, after animation really easily, for example, with Vellum, which is uh, what I'm showing here. So if you look on Mike, the big guy uh, in the red shirt, you see his jaw area is, kind of, is intersecting the upper body a lot. So we wanted to fix that and have some fun with, with some vellum simulation. So you can just use like a sub modify in Solaris and go in and, and set up a sim inside there. I really like doing all the passes just directly in Solaris. Try to use that directly as much as possible. So here you single out the head, you use like a simplified version of his upper body as the collider. And uh, the next thing you need to do is to set up this TET mesh so you have like points inside the head. All of this I stole from Chris's really good Vellum tutorial, which is on YouTube, so definitely check that out. And then you want to do some masks. So for example, the area around the mouth, you don't want that to be too influenced by the simulation because else uh, the lip sync will just look weird, right? So the red parts are following the animation really closely and the blue purple stuff is gonna be more free, more simulated, basically. So here we go get to the fun stuff. <laughs> you basically fiddle with the settings for a little bit uh, <laughs> and you try that and say that looks fun, but maybe a little bit weird. That looks gross, <laughs> but also fun. I think we should keep it. Yeah, we should, <laughs> should actually go in the film. Yeah, and then you find the sweet spot. And now there is no intersection and hopefully not too distracting either. But I think it's fun there's a little bit of floppiness going on. Yeah, so this this is a really fun process, I think. Um, one of my favorite bits, just really polish the CFX on top of the already very cool animation. So here you have with the with the Vellum sim on top. Yeah. Right. That extra bit of secondary motion is super nice. Um but yeah, so uh of course also we're making a film about air travel and stuff, we're gonna need some clouds. Um, and you saw some clouds in uh, the the preview that we showed. Um, and then obviously we're doing some cloud stuff in a way in interior using, again, the Copernicus stuff that Danny was doing with the light filters. Um, but we need to build actual clouds as well. And in Houdini 20, there was all these awesome new cloud tools that came out. Um, there's on the side effects website the content library which has some just unbelievable examples of uh of clouds that they have built that you can just go and grab and and use um and so i actually built a lot of the clouds starting with some of these files um and getting the secret sauce to making them look good which is apparently just like an insane number of volume bounces um but karma can handle it it takes a while to render but uh 
but I, I think it's it's super worth it. Um, so I was working on this sort of intro shot, um, but uh, and it, it was looking super nice with these clouds that I built for it. Again, using sort of the content library as a base, and then kind of creating my own shapes and stuff. Um, but I I felt like it needed more fog, but I didn't want it to be like a consistent sort of like you know uh, solid fog. Um, so um, I realized that with uh, Karma, you can actually now build um, just completely procedural volume shaders and stuff. Um, uh, and it's like very flexible, and there's like quite a bit you can actually do with it. Um, so just building a shader like this, basically, uh, and applying this to a incredibly simple VDB with like out any voxels really, I was able to get like this super high level of detail, which then combined with that other cloud uh, stuff looks you know a lot better and is much closer to what we want for the film. Um, and also, it's just amazing that because all this stuff is just basically a shader, um, I don't have to write out any massive VDBs to the disk for this stuff. Um, I can just build it as a shader the way that I like it and then use it to be kind of the extra clouds in my scene. You know, you're not going to get like the perfect level of control necessarily, but you can do quite a bit with it or you can add extra details to VDBs that are lower res or whatever if you want. Um, and for just having like some random background clouds that are out the window. Oh yeah, and here's the shot animated. Um, so you can see you, you get like a lot of nice depth in the background also, like the clouds go way far back because there's not like a huge cost to adding more VDBs in the background or whatever. It's again, all just a shader that is like, you know, one kilobyte or something like that. Um, and so then, yeah, we need clouds going out the window. Um, and I realize you're able to actually even like add some sort of like swirly motion and stuff and like this is maybe a little bit overkill, but they're just being displaced through sort of a 3D noise here. Um, and it uh, works like surprisingly well for me, I feel. Um, so I may want to add a couple extra custom VDB clouds using like the amazing cloud tools in, in the background. But for the most part, I think that this is going to work for just when you just need extra background clouds or, or fog or stuff that you want to be more detailed than just like a fog box or whatever. Um, and on top of this, it was really nice when I was going to sculpt my own specific clouds and, and build them into the shapes that I want to now have an amazing new uh, sculpting SOP built into Houdini that has move tools and things like that and I think is hopefully the start of some more nicer sculpting stuff that will come in future versions as well. Um, but it's a much, much more legit sculpting tool uh, than we had before in Houdini um, with all kind of a lot of the stuff that you expect like inflate and uh, and and move brushes and, and a lot of other really good stuff. Um, and then, you know, you can use that to, to build some super nice clouds and stuff. Um, so yeah, just having that in there, just for simple stuff, nudging things around, it's like, you know, a lot nicer in a lot of cases than using like an edit sop or a bunch of uh, soft transform sops or whatever like I might have done in the past. Um, so that's a super great addition as well. And yeah, now Magnus can talk about some of the rigging stuff. Yeah. So as Chris mentioned, I did a uh, talk at FMX, just focused on rigging with Apex. So I'm just going to show a little few of the highlights, I guess, from that. Um, but yeah, it was, we, we started out in the beta of Houdini 20 before Apex was even uh, launched. And uh, it, it was a lot of R&D uh, involved involved there and we built our own like auto rigger system with Python. I think now with 25, uh, if, if we had started now, we would just have used the uh, stuff that are released with Houdini. But yeah, that was really a learning experience and uh, very happy with the result and it's fun rigs to animate with, I hope. <laughs> so yeah, I have a very particular style I like to set up. Uh, eyes and the, the face rig from Maya and I was able to to translate that pretty well over to Houdini with, with Apex uh, which was really fun and 
stuff that I did back in the days, I had to kind of scrape my way out of in a in a much more degree to to get the same look across different characters. Doing overrides can be difficult, but with now when I uh, ringing in Houdini, you just make an HDA for the eyes, and you can use them for any character, do any overrides. So that's that's been really really awesome. And here's one of my first tests, uh, getting blend shape system to work. Uh, again, I love that I can just rig inside a SOP create and then have the viewport out to Solaris and have the render running while I'm doing the blend shapes. Uh, and also, I also usually do a lot of look dev while rigging as well. So it's like one, one thing, one process. Yeah, and here is the procedural animation uh, setup we, uh, we were trying for a bit, if that want to play. Oh. Let me see. Come on. Oh, it's oh it on. says no. Let me try this again. Yeah. Should play. Just need some special treatment. Oh, no. It might be broken. Yeah. Okay, but uh, it's in the FMX talk, so <laughs> go watch that. But you can also see it here as well. Um, yeah, that is that is there as well. So you see on the on the left there, uh, it's animated on stepped. Uh, this is animated by Jesper, by the way. And then on on the right, obviously, it he added this procedural uh, chops kind of emotion operators. It's really, you can really control how snappy you want it to be, how much you overshoot, delay certain joints. And uh, so that's been really fun to try to see if we could come up with a style that fits with those tools. And uh, yeah, Jesper is presenting next week at the Paris Hive. And it will be like a full presentation just about that and uh, animation workflow. So the, definitely check that out. And the extra amazing thing about this too is that I think if uh, you know you're animating something and you're not baking in all the keys and you just have sort of the rough thing built out and you can get that last extra bit with just the jiggles and stuff, then if you get a note from a client and they're like, oh, can you make it a little bit more bouncy or a little bit less bouncy or whatever, you just tweak that and then you can build them for an entire day of work. Yeah, so yeah, I just also want to say a huge thanks to the team that helped us especially uh, production manager Ines did an awesome job. Jesper, Meta, and Eric who animated. Super awesome that you wanted to, to try this Houdini journey with us. And also Danny, Cecilia, and Liam that did amazing look dev, and Søren that was just amazing to, with his help for all the pipeline stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's been incredible working with these guys. It's like. The tumblehead guys are just, I feel like, punching way above their weight and you know, leveraging all these cool tools to do it. But yeah, we could not do it without all these amazing people on our team. So thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah. So yeah, we ended a bit early, but I think we have some time for Q&A. Question in the back right here. Uh, hello guys, uh, I was just wondering, like, you use uh, a lot of Houdini in your specialty, like rigging, lightning, VFX, and as I was wondering, you, are you trying to, like, plug in some stuff for, like, modelization? Like, do you, like, you think we could, like, modelize persons, like, characters into Houdini, or do you think it's, like, would take, like, too much time to do everything in Houdini? M modeling? You mean, like, 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 like modeling? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think... Uh, Definitely one of the areas that Houdini could add is sculpting tools and things like that. But there's lots of really amazing modeling tools in Houdini. I know a lot of people are using Houdini for modeling stuff when they need to do procedural modeling stuff, especially. It's like amazing for that. Um, when I'm building characters, sometimes I'm doing like procedural characters and things like that. I built like a whole procedural character generator that I talked about in uh, the talk I did last year. Um, but you can, yeah, you can build some amazing stuff uh, with the modeling tools in Houdini and, and I super recommend checking it out. Um, but also I think that, again, 
with this sort of new sculpting note that they're adding, there's a hint of hopefully more stuff to come in that realm. Um, but yeah, you can, I mean, you can totally make an entire film now just using Houdini. It's got everything that you need. Um, and I definitely would recommend checking out that, uh, that tutorial series that I made for side effects that walks through most of that stuff, including modeling the characters for that. Um, and you can find that easily through the side effects website or their YouTube or my website or uh, HoudiniNerd.com is also a resource that I made for people learning Houdini that has links to lots of tutorials and a Discord and stuff. Um, but yeah, there's there's lots of resources out there for all that stuff. And do you like want to like make of Houdini like uh, a software who like do everything in pipeline 3D, or you like prefer to like I don't know Houdini stays in like VFX because I'm a student and I know that uh, in schools we often uh, use Houdini because of the VFX uh, backgrounds of the software. Yeah, I mean I think it just has a very strong reputation for the VFX stuff, but I think. Uh, it's getting used more. I mean, I know it's used a lot in purely CG films and stuff as well. Like, you know, I know like Pixar has been using it forever for their films for effects and things like that, but it seems like it's also been getting used increasingly in big studios and things like that for uh, character effects in addition to just regular effects, as well as um, being used more the Solaris uh, and uh, sort of scene assembly tools for lighting and, and all that kind of stuff. People are moving more into Houdini. And I think the Apex stuff is the beginning of probably more people starting to do rigging and character animation and more parts of the pipeline in Houdini. Um, it all works still great with other tools as well. And you know, USD is a great thing that SideFX is sort of building a lot of these tools on top of that um, integrates super well with other stuff. But uh, yeah, I think that there's, um, you know, Side effects is always working on trying to help get Houdini to be able to be better at more things in the CG pipeline and and you know also like compositing and things like that as well. So um, so yeah, I would I would say have an open mind and consider using it for more stuff than what people are mostly just using it for. Um, but yeah, thank you. In addition to these awesome dudes that uh, push Houdini in really cool directions, last year we had uh, Rodeo Animation featuring uh, Canary, uh, which is an animated short that, that they uh, did completely in Houdini, except for rigging and animation, because KinFX wasn't really there yet, but um, everything else was. And Peter Knopfs, who's actually sitting right here, uh, did a great talk at The View last year. Yay. Any other questions? Hey guys, great talk, big fan. Um, I've got a very specific question about the, I loved the um, solution you had to the intersecting chin of the mic character and the um, tet solver and the volume thing. Um, I just want to ask, is a solution like that, you said it was done after animation was locked, is it is it responsive enough that you could have that enabled while the animator's working or is it still a bit too expensive that you could have something like that enabled at the same time? I would say it's almost, but yeah. not quite. Okay. But you could do it... What we're doing is just have a button that does like a post thing. So you can animate and just click and export and then you'll see a play blast fairly quickly with that cool. on. But it's a little bit too slow, I think, for animation. But uh, give NVIDIA another round of graphics cards and I, <laughs> I guess we'll get there. <laughs> cool. Thank you. If you have a clever pipeline set up and stuff too, I feel like once you have the animators submit their shot as well, you could have it so that it automatically runs through the setup and then just updates too. But then you won't see the feedback live as the animator necessarily. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully someday soon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, it was an amazing presentation. Uh, I'm Rigger and I was really interested in how to do rig in Houdini. And I have a couple of questions about uh, skinning. You have different, you can apply different skinning weights for the same character. Uh, different skin weights? Yeah. Or I'm not sure if I. I mean, uh, you can like, skin like the layers. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can skin different parts of the character separately and things like that and say, oh, I want these bones to just skin on this part and, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, okay. I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar then with NG skin tools from Maya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I use that too, and 
I fairly quickly was able to build my own setup for that in KinFX to do like skinning layers. Because they have all the low level nodes for it, so you just put it in an HDA. So every node is one skinning layer. And yeah, I think that was really nice because then you had total control over all the skinning. And, and if you had changing topology coming in from the modeling department, you, you could still just transfer the skin layers over like one by one. And uh, yeah, that was really, um, I did not show that in the FMX presentation, but I should probably do it. And it will be shared on the content library once the film is done. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Hello, I'm a big fan of uh, Tumblehead style. I would like to Thank know you. if um, uh, I'm a starting rigger on Maya, and I would like to know if uh, to have this kind of style, is it uh, good to switch from Maya to Houdini, or uh, it's a bit uh, early? For now? I think now is the perfect time. <laughs> like if you get in early, you'll be one of the best riggers in Houdini quickly. <laughs> okay, thanks. Now the tool is already more than good enough to use for for bigger production. So I'm sure there will be a, a big demand for that very soon. Thank you. You'll be ahead of the curve. <laughs> Hello, thanks for the talks. I have a question about uh, Karma. Can you talk about the render time? Is it uh, XP, XPU and how fast it is? Yeah, we're using XPU and everything you've seen is, is still, it's very low sample quality renders with the denoiser. Um, so it's still very rough. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been, I mean, Karma has been unbelievable. I'm like, I've been using it as my main render engine now since I think the end of 2022 um, when it was still I think in beta um, but uh, yeah it's it's just integrated so well into Houdini and and I think it's really important to me that it's very fast in the viewport and giving feedback um, and it's very reliable as well it's not like super crashy for me um, and uh, it's made a lot of progress also over uh, over the the beta for 20.5. So this new version of it, we're finding to be quite a bit faster. Um, they've made some also improvements to like if you're using some of the most recent cards, it's even like a lot faster because it's using some of those new features and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know any. Yeah, I had, I've been using mostly Arnold and then Redshift for many years, and now Karma, and I think it's. Uh, yeah, very comparable render times. I haven't checked it like in every possible scenario, obviously. So, but I think the best thing is that time to first pixel is extremely quick, and for me, that's what matters most when you're actually working in the software. Is that it can do iterations very quickly, and I think XPU there is hard to beat. Okay, thanks. Christo. Uh, thank you guys, amazing talk. I wanted to ask about how the Maya people felt, you know, jumping the animators. Um, maybe it's a question for Mete more, more <laughs> uh, about how they felt uh, jump, switching, in bec switching in because my experience is that they are quite conservative, the, the animators. <laughs> Good and, question. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, and yeah, how do you guys and, sh and she feels about in the future more uh, character animation people be willing to come to Houdini to animate? Do you want to answer, Meta? Can I put you on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I had this message shot uh, that actually I didn't manage to finish. Uh, so I'm so happy that you saw my crappy version of it. <laughs> uh, I said it was work in progress. But <laughs> oh yeah, that's true, that's true, that's good. <laughs> um, <coughs> sorry, uh, it's been a hard week. Uh, I would say like now I spent what, four weeks, three weeks, in Houdini animating, and it took me about a week to like settle in. It's, you know, a little bit new hotkeys where they actually make sense. T is translate, R is rotate, <laughs> and stuff like that. I was like, never even thought of that. <laughs> um, there are some things, like for example, something called notes, where you're just like, what is that? 
<laughs> but if you just think like, okay, that's some Houdini stuff and I don't have to care and don't think about it, just animate, then it's quite good. Like it has what Maya has. It has the graph editor, works. It, you can key stuff, great. And as, my, as uh, uh, Magnus also said, that these scenes are done in stepped. They're not fully splined out at all. You do your main keys, you do your breakdowns, you do your ease ins, ease outs, uh, and then you basically just play around with the jiggle, you play around with the, uh, with the noise. And then, yeah, you, there, was, there was also a note for a secondary action as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you uh, don't have to do all the boring stuff, <laughs> which is just great. <laughs> and as the quote was, like, tween machine, like all the stuff that you can normally get in Animbot, is already in Houdini. So it, in, like, Maya is a tool, right? But you actually animate with all the scripts that you add on. Here you actually animate in Houdini. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bro. Thank you. <laughs> I, I just want to add that the um, automatic overlap and all that stuff is obviously a style choice. You can do fully animated stuff in Houdini, obviously, as well. And, and I would also add really quick that, again, Meta was working with like beta versions of Houdini that were changing every day, and sometimes things would break from day to day. So the fact that she was able to still get up and running in a week, I think, is pretty impressive. Um, yeah. But yeah. Very patient as well. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Uh, it was a very insightful talk. Thank you for Thank that. You. And I could feel the passion uh, in your eyes for Houdini as well, and <laughs> by your looks as well. <laughs> and uh, I have two questions. The first one is, um, how did Houdini, like, um, I don't know, influence your creative process or decision making during the project, if it did? And the second one, how do you see the use of Houdini in the future, like in, in the industry of animation, maybe in the future or like starting on? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's definitely influenced like all of my work a lot. Again, a, a lot. I think both of us are very much people that just like tinkering and playing with new tools, and it's 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 very fun being in the beta, like seeing you know new things pop up every week that we wanted to play with and and try. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, honestly, the only real downside is that like you get so into building some of these little systems that you're having so much fun with that you just become way too detail oriented and you need to just cut yourself off and like move on to some other stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can just tweak and tinker with stuff and get cool results like for hours and hours and hours. And um, yeah, it's, it's just like, I don't know, it feels like a playground and uh, it's, you know, again, amazing working with software where you can really tell the people building the software actually care about the software and the people that are using it. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been amazing, and I, I would highly highly recommend everybody try it if they haven't. In terms of being used in the industry, again, I think it's creeping in more and more and being used in more parts of production. I think you know this new thing is is using it for character animation, but it's being used a lot for scene assembly, lighting, things like that with the USD pipeline and everything. Um, it's been used for character effects for a while. Vellum is amazing. There's some other new stuff coming in that realm that's going to be amazing too. Um, and uh, uh, the effects, of course, it's like, you know, like best in class. Uh, there's no real competition, I feel. Um, and so uh, it's being used for all that stuff a lot. And then also I think like, you know, one of these days we'll see more compositing stuff and maybe it'll be starting to take on some of the compositing tools out there. Um, I think also, you know, again, there's some sculpting stuff that's coming, so maybe we'll start to see more of that. But yeah, it's just a powerhouse software that can do almost everything that we want and anything that it doesn't do that we want, we know that at least it feels like side effects is working towards trying to make those things happen. So um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I don't know if you want to add anything, yeah. Yeah, just want to make everything in Houdini. Yeah. <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> it's super nice to have the whole film in just one graph, basically. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. It's getting there. Something that might not be completely obvious because uh, Houdini is so well known in VFX now uh, is that uh, it has a long history in, in character animation. 
Uh, and the president of the company, uh, Kim Davidson, is in the audience right now. Kim, stand up, <laughs> take a bow. Woo! <laughs> <clears throat> He, he co-founded the company in 1987, is still the president, has an open-door policy at work. He's, he's, he's happy to talk to anybody in the company that has ideas. But the, uh, the incredible thing is, is how uh, um, insanely uh, excited he is about character animation and seeing Houdini uh, come to life, uh, sort of rekindle itself in character animation because it was used there in the past. And he has a strong passion for, uh, for character animation, as a lot of us do. So um, there was another question over here. Yes. Hi, great talk. Thanks for the dancer's uh, mindset from Nette. Um, I was wondering how long did it take for the R&D department to build the outer rigger? And if you would actually prefer to further develop the outer rigger for yourself so it's more user friendly or if you would still prefer KineFX? Uh, so the R&D department uh, for rigging? Uh, me, yeah, uh, <laughs> was yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If uh, that's was right. but working yeah. closely with the devs also. Yeah, working yeah. closely with the devs, so we can include yeah. Esther and Will from and Tom. But yeah, it's. Um, I think it was nice to do our own thing because I think every studio are very particular about how they want rigging, and so even though there is a lot of auto rigging tools provided, especially now in. 20.5, which is right around the corner. Uh, I think most of you probably want to do their own thing anyways uh, to, to kind of get their style and their way of doing animation. And so it's, I think it's just great that you can do both. It's a very open and flexible. Uh, but yeah, it, it took a bit of time because it was so early. So I spent uh, quite a few months uh, with the help of Surin and uh, side effects devs, at that, which I ask every day. Like, <laughs> how do I do this? What node do I need to use for that? And yeah, very helpful. I, I think if the question in, to me is kind of like, if you're going to be either handing this rig off to an animator or you're going to be really animating with it a lot, like it's going to be like, you know, the main character in a film that you're making or something, then I would definitely take the time to at least just set it up with the auto rig stuff with Apex and get a nice control rig going that's really nice to work with. Um, but if you're making stuff really hackily and quickly, then sometimes I might just like keep stuff in KinFX or if you just need a quick like, you know, like rig of like a tree that you can like kind of finesse for an effects shot or something like that, like, you know, I might not bring it into Apex for that. Um, but Apex will kind of seep more and more into more parts of Houdini, I think, and get used more and more for rigging. And the auto rig stuff, is really great. I was able to figure it out pretty quickly after 20 came out, um, and it's just going to get better. Like they're going to side effects is they got to build the low level tools first, and then they're going to put more polish and time into the auto rigs and the higher level tools and stuff, and it's it's going to improve. And so uh, yeah, I think it's definitely worth giving a shot and just trying to get a sense for yourself of like you know what the best approach is for you for any given task or whatever. Um, but yeah. Yeah, sorry, I totally misunderstood your question. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> All right. It was alluded to a few times, but uh, 20.5 is coming soon. Um, next week in Paris, we'll be doing a keynote presentation uh, done by Kristen Barguil and several of our side effects staff. Um, that'll be teased today, so you'll actually get a preview of 20.5 in the next presentation um, for the first time ever in the world, like we've never shown anybody so that's going to be pretty exciting and it's such a good release i'm so excited yeah and then it'll be coming sort of this summer not not uh, immediately after the keynote but soon after any other questions yeah cool hat by the way thanks for the presentation um hopefully not too off uh, topic any experience you guys have with uh, motion capture data, cleaning up and using it, blending it with yeah, with with keyframe animation? Yeah, I I've done a bit of that, mostly just with KinFX. I did a whole uh, TV pilot that was all motion capture um, back in twenty twenty one with Houdini nineteen, mostly I think. Uh, maybe we used a little bit of nineteen point five. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's very, 
very good for that stuff. I think it really is giving, you know, like Motion Builder a run for its money. I'm not a big mocap person expert in general. Um, but um, I do think that uh, that was kind of one of the first things that KinFX was really kind of trying to target was being used for motion capture stuff. And it's amazing. You can, you can easily blend different clips together. You can like select certain things, smooth them out. You can retarget stuff. Uh, I think the FBIK uh, stuff for retargeting is now powered by Apex as well um, under the hood in Houdini. So like, you know, there's a chance that people using KinFX or whatever now, maybe even using bits of Apex and not realizing it. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's super powerful. And, you know, I, I hope that side effects adds more and more kind of procedural, like, like the smooth motion node that they added, I think in the last version was, uh, maybe it was 19.5 was really helpful for being able to smooth out like jitters and mocap and things like that. Um, and then, uh, I think apex is a lot of potential for then giving it to animators to be able to then also add animation layers on top of and stuff too. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super good for that stuff. And I think it's just going to get better over time. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully it will be used more for that. Cool. Thanks. It's probably obvious, but there's a, there's a lot of language in Houdini. There's vellum and KinFX and all these things. Uh, KinFX is the rigging and animation tool set within Houdini. Vellum is soft bodies. Karma's the renderer. Solaris is lighting, layout, and look dev. But it's all included in Houdini, right? Like It's all yeah. Houdini. You get it with Houdini. It's not something else you have to get or some plugin or whatever. It's just names of feature sets within Houdini. So it's it, lots of acronyms, lots of uh, fancy names. <laughs> One of the best things about Houdini, though, is that, yeah, you don't need a ton of plugins for it. It's just, it's all there. You got everything you need. It's amazing. Yeah, over there. Uh, just uh, while seeing also you what you're showing about patterns and textures, mm. uh, I was wondering, uh, do you like also try to uh, make new patterns like uh, improving in uh, texturing on Udini or not at all? Are you trying to oh, like totally? Yeah, I mean, you, you you can you can do all kinds of stuff like that. You can mix it with textures that you got from outside of Udini, but um, yeah, I mean, the cops, the compositing, the Copernicus stuff is very capable, and there's so much. You can do with it. You can make really nice like cloth stitching patterns and things like that with the tile pattern node. Um, you can do all kinds of like compositing type stuff. Um, it's still pretty early days for it, but I think you'll see it evolve a lot more over the coming years, and then maybe become like you know a full fledged kind of compositing alternative to some of the compositing apps. Um, but um, but yeah, it's it's currently. Uh, just super nice to have some of those tools built into Houdini, which kind of opens up like just having more things in one app makes it so that things are much more seam streamlined and 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 seamless and and uh, and you can do things like let's say you know like he's freaking out on the airplane and maybe we'll want to have like the textures on the seats like moving and animating around in cool patterns or things like that you know to sort of emphasize like. Uh, I don't know, the terror or, or make him feel like he's having a bad trip or something like that. Um, but yeah, there's lots of like, you know, sort of nice things about that and uh, a lot of potential there. And, and I think, yeah, you'll see it start to encroach more over time on hopefully like, you know, the substance designer stuff and like Nuke and things like that. Um, but again, all still being built into Houdini and leveraging all those other amazing tools in the rest of the 3D app itself. So yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Well, I'm glad you ended a little early so we could have this great discussion because this has been a really, really nice uh, Q&A session. So thanks, everybody, for your great questions. Awesome. And thank you, too, for the awesome presentation. Thanks thank for having Thank you so us. much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all for coming. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>